Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this panel today. Um, my name is Melissa Graham, and I'll be facilitating this meeting and taking questions after both of our speakers have presented. We're people, people, much the same as everyone else, has been exceedingly difficult, painful, oppressive, and deadly than the pre-existing quote unquote normal state of affairs was also exceedingly difficult, painful, oppressive, and deadly. Insofar as the end of the pandemic is not tantamount to the end of disabling inequality, oppression, and individualism, the question we face will be wither normality. And I just wanna share a really cool um, graphic that I found that relates to this, let's see if this works. Yeah, this is a illustration by uh, Sam Schaefer that was posted to the Disability Visibility blog um, recently. Um, and it's one, it's just, this is just one panel of several, um, which reads, every day I see people wanting things to go back to normal, back to the way things were where we were still suffering and dying. And it's a picture of uh, crutches laying on the ground in an open field with a rainbow and sun in the background. Okay. Um, so um, uh, a recent report by uh, uh, Public Citizen found that a lack of health insurance was a factor in the deaths of approximately one third of the now more than half a million COVID related deaths in the United States. Another one third of COVID deaths in the US have been linked directly to the nursing home industry. Considering that less than 1% of the total US population reside in nursing homes, and only 10% of all Americans age 65 or older, um, the fact that a third of deaths are connected um, to this industry is quite astounding. Um, and, um, you know, I think that this is just one example of how uh, disablement structurally plays out. Um, you know, and that's not even to get into the more egregious examples in the US there were documented cases of disabled people who were hospitalized being denied ventilators in favor of non-disabled patients. And there was uh, discussion among state governments of uh, implementing existing crisis protocols that would allow the forcible quote unquote reallocation of the private ventilators of disabled people um, to be given to non-disabled people. And um, um, yeah, I, I'll leave it there on, on speaking of the, the pandemic. Um, now just a word on the general nature of the uh, talk that I uh, will be giving. Um, you know, there are many aspects of disability and many ways to talk about it. Um, you know, it can be a, a deeply personal thing for some people. Um, some people just look at it as a medical or technical phenomenon. Um, some see it through a cultural or anthropological lens. Um, this talk, however, is based on a, a historical materialist analysis of disability, um, which looks at disability as an evolving uh, political, economic, and historical phenomenon. Specifically, is it is an analysis of the manner in which disability manifests under modern capitalist society. Of course, as long as there have been humans on the planet, there have been a vast array of physical and mental attributes, abilities, variations, and impairments. In this sense, disability broadly defined is and always has been an inextricable and natural feature of our species. However, the modern understanding of disability 
as a categorical, phenotypical, distinct set of uh, you know human traits and characteristics, as it is defined in legal, political, and economic terms, is a relatively recent development. Um, uh, also, I'd just like to give a brief word on my own uh, background and interest in the topic. Um, I sort of came to develop a political or um, you know, social theoretical understanding of disability um, more recently uh, in, in my life and in the last five to 10 years or so, um, which was primarily a function of two things. Um, uh, one, I had been uh, a longtime political activist, socialist, um, but had uh, uh, only more recently discovered um, that there were radical analyses of disability uh, out there written by socialists and activists. And two, you know, I reflected uh, at simultaneously upon my own life experience dealing with chronic mental illness and related uh, uh, mental uh, impairments. And it made me reflect upon my own self, my history differently, including the notion of what it means to be normal or fit into society uh, within a broader context. Um, put bluntly, I began to see how the society in which we presently live, organized on the basis of capitalist social relations, breeds its own unique forms of human behavior, organization, uh, and differentiation. These forms are different than that which prevailed in all pre-existing modes of society and will presumably be different um, in whatever mode of society eventually replaces capitalism. Um, as I said, disability as we have come to know it today first emerges uh, in widespread form with the rise of industrial capitalism. And with it, the notion that an individual's value can be determined by their capacity to engage in waged labor, um, predominantly uh, in a factory setting, at least in its initial uh, inception. In pre-capitalist society, the basic unit of human existence was the tribe, the clan, the community, the family, village. Uh, work was by and large done uh, by the social group um, with a relative degree of uh, collectivity, uh, with people pitching in where they could. Although there was certainly, you know, ignorance um, around uh, impairment um, or uh, physical or mental anomalies um, that, uh, that people embodied, um, we do not uh, in, in these pre-capitalist moments, see the you know, widespread or systematic segregation um, of a social group into a categorical distinction of being um, uh, able to do things and those who are not able to do things um, or, uh, um, or, you know, at least specifically in relation to the, um, the productive activities of society. As capitalism, oh wow, it's already been 10 minutes. I just saw that. All right, well, I'll make this maybe <laughs> an abridged version of the talk I was gonna give. Um, so um, as, as you know, I was saying, uh, capitalism emerges and um, breaks up this old mode of existence um, and, uh, and replaces it in one in which the, uh, uh, you know, as we have today, means of production are largely owned by a pr privately, by, by uh, uh, a minority of society um, that comprise the capitalist class. All others are uh, compelled to um, earn their subsistence by being able to sell their labor power to those who own the means of production. And they sell their labor power in competition with one another. Um, and uh, therefore, those who um, don't independently own means of production or wealth um, 
are, are find their very uh, their very uh, bodies and minds, um, which uh, together um, form the the essence of their labor power. They find that um, valued um, according to its relative productivity or profitability from the standpoint of capitalism. Um, and those who are deemed less productive or profitable um, in that schema are um, shunted aside, marginalized, disadvantaged. Um, and that is um, historically how a class of disabled people um, emerges and then it's codified and legislated and regulated by the state as those who are deemed unable to engage in uh, gainful activity within the context of the uh, okay, in the context of the uh, labor market. And um, so for instance, in the US, um, according to the Social Security Administration, disability is literally defined as an ability to engage in waged labor to meet one's own needs. So it's a eminently economic and uh, political economic term. Um, this class of disabled people have been, um, as I said, largely um, externalized to the formal uh, uh, labor market and have been um, dealt with to varying degrees in a number of ways, um, up to including being um, wholly segregated off from society and placed in separate institutions, asylums, uh, mental and rehabilitative hospitals, um, as well as um, uh, in maybe this, you know, one of the stark, starker chapters from uh, at least US, but uh, uh, global history, um, people were subjected to eugenic measures, sterilization and, um, and so on um, as a way to uh, eliminate the clinical problem of this disabled population that were at best seen as irrelevant or superfluous to the um, process of capital accumulation, or at worst, were seen as an impediment to that process. Um, and, um, you know, this, this division of the uh, working class, broadly speaking, into those who are uh, uh, non-disabled people who are in the workforce and disabled who are uh, externalized um, is one that, um, as um, you know, Martha Russell has put it, and Ravi, uh, my co-presenter, has put it, is a, a system that is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, injurious, oppressive to those on either side of the divide. Right? You're, either in, you're either compelled to participate in this system of uh, exploited wage labor, um, or you are externalized to it, and you're compelled to live a, uh, on, a, on a subsistence of state aid that is intentionally designed to be below whatever is the prevailing or minimum wage that one could garner through participation in the labor market. And this is done um, uh, as I said, deliberately, so as to discourage anyone who may try to avoid um, uh, remuneration through wage labor um, uh, by uh, instead um, relying on, on state aid. Um, that being disabled and being outside of the workforce should be broadly seen as an inferior option as a uh, less desirable option to waged labor. And so it is materially structured. And so it's no accident that disabled people overwhelmingly have higher rates of poverty and homelessness and unemployment and uh, such related metrics. Um, and um, uh, let's see, I guess I will start to wrap up. I think I've gone for a while. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just say that this, um, uh, uh, as, oh, here's the quote I, I wanted to read. Martha Russell puts it really well. 
Capitalism is a system that forces non-disabled persons into the labor market, but just as forcefully coerces uh, many disabled persons out. Oppression occurs in either case. Um, and I just will end by emphasizing this point. Um, you know, we uh, have an economy with capitalism that organizes production and the labor process around the maximization of profit, not around the maximization of human well-being and happiness. It is an economy in which the human laborer is expected to adapt themselves to the conditions of labor as defined by the boss, rather than one in which the conditions of labor are adapted to the needs of the human laborers. It is a system in which one portion of society is forced to work longer and longer hours while another portion of society has trouble obtaining work at all. It is a system in which our value as individuals is determined by the price we can fetch on the labor market, a market which is not only fickle and insecure, but ignores all other aspects of humanity from which we could possibly derive self-worth and value. Uh, I believe that what we need is a society organized around the exact opposite set of principles. That is a genuinely social uh, ist society. To quote Marta Russell again, uh, who in turn was uh, quoting Karl Marx, our goal should simply be the creation of a society based upon the idea from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Keith. Um, I'll let Ravi speak next, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Melissa. Merci à tous et toutes pour cette opportunité de parler cet après-midi avec vous. Mais je vais continuer en anglais parce que Keith est américain, donc je pense que ça marche bien. Donc, uh, so I'm going to be speaking in English today, and I'm just going to share my screen just a second yeah okay. this always takes me a minute Okay, so uh, I think that you're now able to see my screen. Uh, if that's, is that right? You can see it? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna uh, continue. So before I go on, uh, I'm just going to uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from uh, Algonquin uh, unceded territory. Uh, the Algonquin people are the uh, traditional uh, guardians of this land. We acknowledge at the University of Ottawa, their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. And we acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking to you about assisted suicide also known as death making. This is an issue that's been very controversial for people on the left, been very misunderstood. And uh, I don't actually take a position yay or nay on assisted suicide or death making. Instead, what I wanna do is suggest that we rethink some of these questions uh, and do so by reconceptualizing how we feel about the role of disabled people in the world. And so I think in that sense, you know, I was also somebody who was a big fan of Murder Russell, uh, and I, I did an anthology, Disability Politics, Global Economy, that you can get uh, devoted to Murder on, uh, from Rutledge. And I think in that sense, my talk, although specialized, narrower in conception, does, I think, fit in to what uh, Keith's talking about. So I'm going to try and focus on political economy a little bit more but you do need to understand a little bit about why it is we got here. And so many people in uh, the Canadian state, in Canada, in Quebec, misunderstand uh, why it is that the central organizations of disabled people in uh, the Canadian state 
have taken positions critical of death-making assisted suicide. And that all goes back to the murder of Tracy Latimer, who was a small child, was murdered in the early 90s by her father. And in a nutshell, she had cerebral palsy and the community was very upset, the disability community, that there seemed to be widespread sympathy and support for Robert. And akin to sexual violence, it seemed that Tracy, the young girl who was 12 when she was murdered, was put on trial to have to demonstrate why it is she should be alive rather than the conduct of Latimer. And of course, this is all without consent. It's very different from either even the most radical conceptions, uh, I would argue, in the Canadian context. And so COPO, which is now known as the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, shifted its initial position in favor of people like Sue Rodriguez, who I should point out immediately, those are people who are adults that are seeking assistance. So it's very different from the Tracy Latimer situation, but CCD over time shifted its position to one that's critical of it. And so when assisted suicide was legalized with the current federal government, the Trudeau government, uh, there was uh, continued uh, hostility to this or critical uh, attitude. And that's only been accelerated with the uh, very recent amendments that further expand assisted suicide uh, that only received royal assent this year during the pandemic. I think whatever your position is, I think that was not a fortuitous moment for the federal government instead of dealing with the pandemic to go and accelerate assisted suicide. But the argument is that with the outcome of Trousseau, the federal government, it's a court decision in Quebec, they decided not to appeal the decision and ran through uh, legislation. This is not a legal conflict. So I'm going to tread lightly on, on the law, but I think it's needed to have some background. So in order to understand this, one of the big problems is the media portrayal of the Latimer case. Disability rights advocates felt that the message being communicated was Latimer was a hero. And if you go read the articles that people like me and others have written, you'll see that you know a lot of media portrayed Robert as a hero. There was a museum uh, in Alberta that had a exhibit that on the quality of mercy that included Robert Latimer, Mahatma Gandhi of India, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So which one of these is not like the other? Is it, you know, is that, you know, so it, it seemed uh, very strict. And there's a very graphic descriptions of Tracy's bowel movements. And instead of focusing on the conduct of the father, the fact that she played games, enjoyed music, my uh, friend uh, and uh, independent scholar, Heidi Jans, from Alberta has written extensively about uh, the Latimer case, uh, if you're interested uh, in reading more. And so CCD uh, or COPO developed a coalition uh, with other disability rights organizations. And it's a pretty broad consensus, unlike the strong support of Canadian society overall uh, against uh, the way uh, this has been portrayed and against assisted suicide. So it was felt that the specific structural discrimination that people with disabilities have experienced, stereotyping had not been addressed and that you wanna look at the equality guarantee in section 15 of the charter. And they relied on social model thinking and the British social model in particular uh, has been influential in Canadian uh, civil society and disability studies, much more so than it has been in the United States where post-structuralists have dominated. So Mike Oliver, who passed away recently, uh, you know, I had the honor of writing an obituary that appeared in the Nation uh, Forum. The Oliver version of the social model, I would argue is much more influenced by Marxism uh, and class politics than some of the more postmodern interpretations. And so, uh, you know, some examples of disability oppression uh, are things like the Ashley X case uh, in the United States where parents of children with intellectual disabilities want to use growth attenuation uh, surgery to keep, or medical treatment, I should say, to keep their children short in stature, uh, which is basically experimenting on the children uh, rather than uh, obtain assistance in order to care for them at home. This is extremely controversial. And essentially you're engaged in a longitudinal experiment uh, with hormonal treatment, uh, which eliminates the child's periods uh, and 
it's unclear what the long-term effects are simply to keep the child shorter in stature. And they also gave their child a double mastectomy, which again, many people in the disability community feel is dis regarded as disfigurement. And so this is sort of a background of the reality of disabled people, critical attitude to medical uh, intervention. But there's also, of course, and I think Keith's alluded to this in his presentation, the socioeconomic side. So people with disabilities, particularly women with disabilities, live in structural poverty. Uh, and people with disabilities still are getting paid low minimum wages uh, in sheltered workshops in, uh, in some contexts. The coalition that CC developed also raised issues around pain and disability. That pain is simply part of life when you have a disability, and it's not reasonable to judge the quality of somebody else's life. And so you can argue that the current legislation doesn't go that far, but the 2021 amendments go pretty far in terms of allowing people with mental illness uh, that, and removing the foreseeability requirement, uh, foreseeability of death, that's very challenging. Uh, and so the fear of many activists, advocates, is that there is going to be pressure for people with disabilities to end their lives uh, rather than address the structural barriers they face. And so I don't know how much uh, time I have. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the Rodriguez case is an example uh, where she was a woman, an adult with ALS, and she had litigated. The Supreme Court of Canada very narrowly upheld the prohibition on assisted suicide. And uh, for many years, that was the status quo. Uh, and they said that there was no societal consensus, but the liberal government that was elected around 2015 has brought in first uh, assisted suicide on a limited basis. And then this year, very recently, they expanded assisted suicide to include people with psychiatric conditions and they've removed uh, you know, the reasonable uh, foreseeability requirement. So it's unclear how things are gonna go uh, forward. And so there's been this gradual movement uh, for assisted suicide, but the question has to be asked, what does that mean uh, in terms of autonomy in light of neoliberal austerity, extreme wait times for attendant services, people who require assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting, the attendants, uh, there's a huge waiting time, but there's also a very uh, many sorts of barriers in terms of limited number of hours. And there's a growing trend even in, in Canada and the nation of Quebec in institutionalizing younger people in institutions. And certainly Marta Russell is someone who wrote extensively about that, but I think a lot of Canadian social justice activists are not aware of the extent to which people in their 20s and 30s have no other choice but to live in institutions uh, in the Canadian state. And I think that is, uh, is troubling. So, uh, and so there was further litigation that led to the liberal legislation. That's the, uh, the Carter decision. And there the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously said that the ban on assisted suicide violated the charter. I'm not here to take sides on the legal jurisprudence. You know, it seemed to me, those of you that have a legal background, it seemed quite obvious this is the way the court would go. Disability rights organizations intervened in Carter, but that seemed to me to be a foregone conclusion, although it was decided under Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, not under the equality provision. I think that's probably a good thing. And that led to uh, assisted suicide legislation the government calls made. I'm going to call assisted suicide or death making. Uh, you know. And so instead of taking a position, what I do here, and I I know I'm speaking on this panel with two very distinguished revolutionary socialists, you know, but this is a Castoriadan approach, you know, probably petty bourgeois heresy for those of you that are trained in the Trotskyist tradition. But Castoriadis wrote a, a very interesting book, Mel's Psychoanalysis with Marxism. Okay. So, uh, you know, Castoriadis was ignored for many years, but I think it's time for socialism or barbary to have a renaissance. You know, and so the imaginary institution of society. I've tried to encourage many of my friends, you know, to go out and read Historianus. I haven't been very successful with that. But, you know, he uh, emphasizes creativity and the construction of social imaginary significations. 
it's it's a different ontology. You know, it's not exactly Marxism. It's not exactly anarchism. I think it transcends both. But by doing so, it conceptualizes a new way of living. And I think that allows opportunity for engagement with disability studies, because you can question why it is we use productivity as the yardstick or the measuring stick for valuing a disabled people. And in that sense, I think a Castoriadan reading uh, melds nicely with the legacy of Marta Russell. And it's certainly in the book that I wrote as a feshrift or a, a tribute to Marta. Uh, my chapter was a different intervention on Castoriadis. And I would argue that the people like uh, Jasper Poir, who very kindly cited my, my work uh, that I co-wrote with Marta uh, in Socialist Register, and certainly at the Leo Panish tribute, I, uh, I had mentioned this in the Quested period because I was so grateful that Leo gave us that opportunity to do for Marta and I to do this work. Uh, but I think that it provides a different approach than those people like Jasper Poor, who yes, have cited us, but they're very much influenced by uh, the biopolitics of debilitation. Their work derives from a Foucauldian Deleuzian framework. It's very pessimistic. It's biopolitics regulation all the time. The Foucault Deleuze state surveillance is oppressing you all the time. It's, I'm not saying they're wrong in their analysis, but the Foucauldian Deleuzians don't really provide an alternative. Again, I respectfully submit the Castorian approach, you know, provides an alternative. It's not class politics all the time. I, I find the, the pure Trotskyist tradition, Cliff and Mandel, I think it's sterile or limited in some respects, but this provides an approach that you can take the best insights of psychoanalysis and combine it with class politics. I think it provides uh, an opportunity to address people where they are. Marxism has its strengths, but it's not so good at analyzing people who are outside the labor market. Well, here's a wake up call. People with disabilities are mostly outside the labor market. And so that, that has left disability studies at the mercy of Deleuzians. Uh, you know, and I think that Castori Addis provides an interesting opportunity to have a class politics that also allows for a theory of disabled. Someday maybe I'll write a book about this if I actually have the time, but I'm not competent enough uh, in uh, political economy, I think, to do that right now. But what we do is consider how you'd reconceptualize how we value disabled people, move away from a link between productivity in the workplace and our value in society, create new symbolic networks. So a lot of people, I have friends, they take up their time doing wheelchair dance and they make huge contributions, but it's not wage labor. Why couldn't you see that as something that we're going to value in society? You know, and so there's a whole field, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada, Sins Invalid are uh, with disability arts. It keeps nodding, but I think Canadians and uh, the Quebecois are less familiar with disability arts in the Canadian state and the Quebec nation, I don't think we have the same development. An ontology of disablement that allowed for this, that got away from accommodating barriers after the fact. So I'm a legal scholar. Canadian human rights law is all about a duty to accommodate up to the point of undue hardship. Surprise, surprise, employers have good legal counsel and oftentimes people with disabilities, disabled people are shut out because everything's an undue hardship. You know, it doesn't allow for that sort of transformative uh, politics. Classical Marxism has largely been restricted to uh, what the work class does. It doesn't really have an opportunity to include people with disabilities and others. Uh, you know, I think that's been styled the lumpen proletariat. It's been marginalized and it's been left to Foucault and Deleuze, but their theories don't provide a path forward I feel that the legacy of Castoriadis, a Castoriadan approach, and this is what I try and do in this, uh, really provides an alternative. I feel, do, do I have one or two minutes left? I don't know how I'm doing for, for time here. Yeah, I'm okay. So in this, this is a project that is a book chapter, thanks. Uh, you know, and so uh, 
I'll be publishing this in a book uh, edited, co-edited by Kelly Fritch and some others that I think are much closer uh, to the anarchist tradition. So some of you that uh, live in the Canadian state may be familiar with upping the ante. And so Kelly Fritch teaches at Carleton University. She's uh, done a lot of interesting work around these issues. And so this presentation uh, is a book chapter. It's one of these rare occasions where I've written the chapter and then done the presentation. Usually it's the other way around, but this chapter is written uh, and uh, peer reviewed. And so if you check out the University of British Columbia Press website, you're gonna find that, uh, that Kelly Fritz has this anthology on criminology and disablement. And if any of you are interested, you know, happy uh, you know, to uh, send out more information uh, but it will be out this fall, uh, along with uh, people that are working on criminology issues facing other marginalized groups. And so I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to present this in, uh, in that uh, collection that Fritch Monahan and Emily Vandermeulen, if I've said Vandermeulen, I think I've said that right, uh, are doing. And so these three scholars have assembled uh, the series of contributors. And that's where uh, this particular presentation is uh, going to be published. So I think with that, you know, I'll, I'll turn it back to Melissa Messe. Toujours un plaisir d'avoir l'opportunité de parler avec vous cet après-midi. Et uh, uh, si vous avez les questions en anglais ou français, je vais répondre si, uh, si je peux. Merci. Thank you, Rabbi, for for that excellent presentation. You've certainly given me a lot to think about. Um, if you wouldn't mind just stopping your screen share so it's a little easier for me to see oh. the screen, that'd be excellent. Um, I I think if uh, participants have questions, they can post them in the chat and I, I'd be happy to read them off. Um, if you want to let me know if they're for a particular speaker or for both of the panelists, that'd be great. Um, I was going to have uh, the panelists wrap up at the end, but based on the number of attendees we'll have, we'll just see how it goes. Well, maybe maybe I'll I'll start off with one, maybe just to get people going. Um, I've had the pleasure actually of reading both of your work. Um, I'm doing my PhD in social work right now and trying to tell us a lot of the ableism inherent in social work. And I too have been looking for all alternatives to this idea that disablement um, needs to be measured in productivity. And I think a lot of the mainstream discipline movements have been leaning into that idea. And, you know, in my mind, it has the potential if we keep going the way that we're going to sort of create a tier, a two tiered system of a activism and disability with those who could could easily find their lives and quote unquote normalized with um, obvious barriers removed and and those who will who will still um, find themselves in a sort of a uh, non working class. Um, I wondered if you have any thoughts on, as we're talking about transitions today, how to sort of encourage things to go to go differently, and what, how to move that forward. Either of you. <laughs> I will. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, um, I think that is a, a important question. Um, it's a bit, I do feel, um, it's a daunting question. Um, and, um, I guess I just wanted to, well, I wanted to start by saying, yeah, I'm actually also currently finishing a graduate studies program in disability studies, um, through university here in uh, New York City. And um, it's interesting because I, um, um, I have uh, mostly sort of just um, 
you know, self, self-taught, self-learned, um, you know, uh, about um, disability politics and capitalism and disability um, outside of a uh, academic setting, mostly just from reading the works of Ravi Malhotra and Marta Russell and others. Um, but now that I'm, you know, now that I've become more uh, ensconced in it, um, you know, I, I do get more of a flavor of the different debates and discussions that are out there. Um, I guess what I would just say is that, you know, in relation to what Rowley was mentioning about, um, just, you know, uh, I would argue narrow um, sort of interpretation of, um, of uh, you know, uh, Marxism and, um, you know, political economy is thinking about um, disability just in relation to, um, you know, the fact that it's largely um, a uh, phenomenon externalized to the labor market. Um, I, I would I would argue for a sort of expansive understanding of um, social relations under capitalism, and um, I think a Marxist analysis enables one to look at disability as a uh, question of uh, relations to the production process, rather than you know just occupying the um, you know formal uh, wage laboring um, populace, but um, a sort of total understanding of um, the social system. And, um, and I think what um, groups like uh, Sun's Invalid, which Robbie mentioned, which put forward, uh, you know, a, a uh, what's called a disability justice framework, which is explicitly counterposed to the um, sort of wave of disability activism and discourse, which uh, has, I think, largely dominated in at least the US throughout the period of the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, which is the sort of more main, mainstream disability rights movement, um, which has been more about how do we get integrated into society? How do we, um, you know, get, how, how do we make it so that disabled people are able to, um, get some sort of degree of um, foothold into the existing social relations. And I think disability justice, um, and people should read on it because it's really quite good, um, I think uh, uh, critiques that um, precisely for the extent to which it adapts to um, uh, the um, uh, ideological and um, you know, material relations of capitalism and with it, the, you know, racial, sexual oppression, uh, imperialism, um, and so on and so forth. So, I, you know, I would point to that as sort of the path forward to uh, thinking about how the direction that I think disability studies should go, that disability politics and activism should go, and a way for the left to get better engaged in this question, which um, I you know, I agree with Robbie that the left is is um, either benignly ignorant of disability politics or radical disability analysis, or just you know not entirely getting it. Thank you, Keith. Um, I see a few questions here in the chat, or I think the first two are for Robbie. Maybe Robbie, I could read those off, and then if you want to, I think they're very similar questions. If you want to tackle both of those at the same time. Um, and then there's another question, a third question there, I think, for both of you. Um, so, sorry, Ravi, you're on mute. Do, do you not want me to respond to your question uh, at this point? Or? I'm just also cognizant of time. Um, you can if you want. Well, why don't but, I answer your question first, and then, okay. uh, then I'll uh, try to answer it these other questions to try to make sure we bring uh, Keith into this. And we, uh, there, there was a, a question that I saw, but I don't, see, it seemed to have disappeared. I don't, maybe I just haven't scrolled properly, but uh, uh, 
Okay, so in terms of the question, I think that really at the core, you want to take a strategy that's uh, both uh, builds, I think, struggle towards accessibility that, that's radical, but at the same time, also building strategies that seek strategic reform. So that doesn't necessarily have to take a litigation strategy. That's what I'm most fluent as a legal scholar. It could also be political lobbying, but I think there's too many people that have an either or position. That's either all you do is the sort of things that's outside the state, uh, or all you do is lobbying and taking large government grants, which is a big problem in the Canadian state. And then you're worried about what you can say because all you're doing is, is taking money from the state. It limits what you can do. You, you sort of have to be able to keep a critical distance, but also uh, do strategic justice. So, I mean, it, the part that he, the point Keith was making about disability justice, uh, certainly it's something as a scholar, I had to rethink a lot of what I do because that's something that came about really recently. I've been teaching since 15 years and many of my students are disability activists that are particularly in the uh, autism community that are doing radical neurodiversity work. That's not something I'm very familiar with. I had to teach myself a lot of this stuff. I think disability justice fits well on student questions rather than other questions. It, it fits better than uh, on some things, better than others. And it's sort of a strategic choice. I think that's a, a gun. But can I, so there was a question, if that's an adequate answer, I can answer the question. There was a question for me from uh, Madeline uh, Brugger, which I don't see any, maybe it disappeared, but I, it was. I have it, I can read it for you if you like. Uh, yeah, do you want to do that? Uh, I think Elise also copied it here in the chat. Uh, she says, thank you for the interesting talk, Ravi. I'm wondering if you can provide a bit more explanation on the ways in which, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce it, Castoradian approach specifically relates to MAID and the ways in which MAID is perceived by the public in regards to disabled people. And for those of you that may not be Canadians here today, MAID is our um, assisted suicide legislation. Right. So. I don't genuinely do not take a position on this, the actual substance. What I think Castori Addis does, what I say in this book chapter, is that probably there's always going to be people that will want, in some cases, are going to want to commit suicide. The thing about Castori Addis that I like is provides an ontology for a new way of looking at the world. That, and so I haven't had the opportunity here, the time is limited, to give a full treatise on Castorianus, notions of auto-creation, his work in socialism, and you know, this sort of thing, uh, which I think is not well known, particularly in the English speaking world, but I think it provides a different way of conceptualizing things. It's a, it's a different way, concepts of auto-creation, I think are quite dynamic. It's not building a vanguard party. It's not exactly anarchism, but it's, it's something I think that has insights that I think, you know, allow you to look at notions of work in a different way. And that's, you know, and, and that's the concept that I leave with. Is it a master blueprint? No, not at all. You know, that's going to be developed over time, but I think that it provides a different way of looking at things. I think there's always going to be people that will want to commit suicide. And that's why I don't take uh, opportunity. What I, uh, you know, so Professor Burgart had a question Part of her question was about the public. And I do think that many, many Canadians just see this as something involving elderly people. And so there's this widespread support about people that have Alzheimer's and that are 85 years old. And I think what gets very complicated, and I, I didn't get into all of this, is the 2021 amendments uh, are leading us in a direction. Uh, and this is a complicated topic, better suited for a, you know, for a, for a legal paper but in, into mature minors. Let's so say you've got people that say I have a progressive disability. Those are my friends. You know, you've got a disability, uh, but in many cases they may live to be 40, 50, 60. These things are uncertain. I don't think the framers, uh, the people who are big advocates in the right to die movement, my sense is they're very much thinking about boomers. And, and that's how I'm all over the place. The people that are very radical opposed to it say that this is very much white boomers that have not thought about racialized people that live in poverty that are going to be very vulnerable in this situation. I think there's, but I don't take a position yay or nay. 
I'm just saying you can think about the world in a different place. So let's just leave some time for Keith to comment. Um, yeah, I um, actually, Melissa, or, or uh, what time do we have until the, for the just, to, just to get a sense of how much time we have left? We have 20 minutes overall, I think. Left? Okay. I will keep it relatively brief then. Um, I guess I want to say, I, I want to say one thing that it wasn't exactly a question posed. But it's something I, I didn't want to respond to something that, yeah, uh, you know, in relation to Robbie's talk about, you know, the this issue of um, legalized uh, assisted suicide. I do think, you know, one thing I do want to say is, you know, um, it's certainly the case that there are different positions on this amongst um, disabled people broadly um, within, you know, the disability organizations, I think that it is more uh, generally uh, opposed. Um, but I do think that, you know, regardless, I do think that left uh, organizations and publications need to be able to talk about it more in a more informed manner than I have seen. Um, you know, I was actually, I guess it's incidental, um, I guess Spain recently legalized um, uh, euthanasia assisted suicide because the, there was an article in the US based uh, Jacobin um, online magazine a couple of weeks ago, with a, uh, which is a publication of the Democratic Socialists of America, in which the author um, was speaking on this uh, uh, legislation in Spain and essentially arguing in favor of it, you know, which is on, on, you know, on its own fine. But um, it was done in a, in a way that was utterly ignorant of critiques of uh, euthanasia that come from disabled people and disabled activists. And so the, you know, the author posed it as, you know, leftists who are for people having self-determination and right to end their life versus reactionaries and religious fanatics. And that's, you know, it was reduced to that. And I, and I think that that's just, um, it's ignorant and it's, it's not helpful, um, you know, and I mean, I, there's more uh, I could say, but I remain, I remain very skeptical of pushes to, uh, um, you know, uh, to broaden the number of people that are uh, being euthanized or taking their own life. I mean, you know, for me, like I said, my um, personal connection with disabilities through my own um, history of um, psychological uh, illnesses and impairments. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, um, you know, mostly it gets framed as like people who have physical disabilities that want to end their life. And it's posed as because, um, you know, um, well, whatever rationalizations happen. But what if there's somebody that's, you know, put up severely psychologically ill or disabled that wants to end their life? I mean, you know, generally, I would say that those people should be helped to uh, access health care and treatments and, you know, more uh, social and solidarity support and networks rather than someone saying, you know, let me help you, you know, end your life. Um, you know, that, so that's my, the other thing I'll just um, say is there was a question about unions, I just briefly um, I do think that unions do, you know, insofar as they organize workers in the workplace to control the conditions of work, I think that there is a um, element there that is, uh, you know, in harmony with disability politics, right? Um, on several levels, one, you know, unions have been historically pushing for um, disability insurance or, um, you know, paid disability leave. Um, for uh, union members. Um, also, insofar as this question of being able to adapt the working conditions or secure accommodations, workers that are, have you know, collective protection are better able to advocate to um, you know, adapt the work environment to their needs, right? It's a question of who controls 
the conditions of, of the work process. Um, um, but I do think, you know, what Robin has uh, said is that, you know, for those uh, people who under the context of capitalism, which is organized around a competitive labor market, there are those who um, are just not going to be part of the formal workforce as long as production is organized the way it is. And that sort of makes that population a bit outside of the ambit of labor unions and narrowly, you know, narrowly understood. And I think that's where having a more, um, uh, you know, expansive understanding of um, the need to mobilize all exploited and oppressed people um, to have an entirely different way that we think about organizing an economy and organizing the work and distribution of our resources. Can I just add something really quickly before you go on, Melissa? I guess, sure. Okay, just really quickly, you know, and this responds a little bit to what Keith's saying, but also to, which I largely agree almost completely with uh, Keith's nuanced comments, but also to go back to Professor Burgard's comment just really quickly is uh, sometimes it's a question of timing. And so while the Trudeau government's response to COVID-19 has not been quite as bad as say Mr. Trump, I think it's almost uh, NPR is now saying 900,000 deaths and the American government systematically undercounted. We also have vast systemic problems. And so there was a strategic choice when the Trousseau decision came out. It was a choice the federal government made to proceed with assisted suicide legislation, uh, which I think appeals to their voter base. Of groups. It's not, they could have passed COVID relief legislation, which is within the federal sphere. Those of you that are Canadian, but that there is uh, a whole range of emergency measures that the Ottawa government chose not to do. And instead, they spent all this time on assisted suicide during a pandemic. A lot of disabled people, I think, would find that to be bad timing, even those who are. And there are many that are supporters of the idea would think this is not a good time. That's it. Just on. Yeah. I think some of that might have been that the ball was already rolling before COVID, but um, yeah. Um, so we have other questions. Um, I don't know, Ravi, if you wanted to address Mark's questions about um, unions supporting disability rights in the workplace at all, if you want to speak to that. Oh, um, I also just want to make sure we got to um, Paul's question, which was, sorry, also directed at Ravi about um, Castoretis and um, had many intellectual turns in his career toward the end of his career. Um, yeah, yeah, I see the well, questions. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's good. No, and I, and I think at least the first one is something an activist like Keith, I'm sure, would have rich experiences, you know, to tell us through this conference. I had the opportunity to hear from people like uh, Megan at, at the Tribute for Leo that, were, that have been doing work uh, on the Bernie campaign with, with union activists in Nevada. So certainly somebody like Keith uh, could definitely speak on that. But I, I think... So to, to respond to uh, Professor Thomas, I think that the uh, approach really is uh, to have unions develop uh, disability caucuses. And they were, you know, it's, it's difficult to generalize, but more and more unions are having identity caucuses. They do exist in some unions. So I think some public sector unions, I think I went to a meeting of one at the Public Service Alliance, but I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of these trade unions are not exactly, uh, radical in their day-to-day -day functioning. Some of them are more bureaucratic than others, and they don't necessarily have rank and file activity uh, in general, not just on disability. So it's it's a fairly tall order, I think, to get it. You know, what I know is quite distanced from working class politics because I, I live in academia. But I mean, uh, so certainly the uh, faculty, I mean, unlike the states, faculty do have unions, you know, for most, but they're not exactly uh, necessarily radical in terms of how they orient towards uh, the employer. And so certainly I, I did, uh, you know, it's not a secret that I, I engaged in the human rights complaint to get my union to uh, make their offices wheelchair accessible. And so certainly that's, uh, but, but in terms of addressing the employer, I think the first step 
is to have union caucuses. Some have good records, some have different records, but I mean, it's the general problem is most people with disabilities are not in the labor market. And so it, there's limited possibilities on this front. And, and of course, not everybody that has a job, even, even in a place like Quebec is necessarily a member of a union. You know, Ottawa's uh, relatively unionized, but you know, if you're not in a uh, union, that's going to be a problem too. So, I mean, you know, but I think union caucuses would be a place to start. Um, I don't know if each of you want a few minutes to wrap up because we kind of altered our format of it as we've been along. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I don't see any more questions, although I could certainly pull a few out of my hat if you wanted. Um, what do we think? Do you have anything you had left to say? Oh, I could just ask you my question and see where that takes us. Um, here in Canada, sorry. Well, I was, you know, I was going to just ask Melissa, and maybe we could take this on. I'm curious what your thoughts are about any of these questions that have been asked or any of these topics. If you want to just maybe speak extemporaneously for a bit, I, I'd be very interested. Well, I didn't I didn't invite you to do that. Okay. Well, I'm not going to speak to the gas routing approach because, to be honest, I don't really know anything. Yeah. <laughs> What comes to mind for me as we're speaking to a lot of this is how often disabled people are asked to do uh, unpaid labor in in the effort to advocate for their community. Um, I can only speak from the perspective of living in the Canadian state. The, the federal government here in Canada is particularly notorious um, for its anticipation of unpaid labor to support its own efforts. So I'm speaking most recently with the accessibility standards that they're trying to create federally. Um, there's been a lot of unpaid labor in regards to that, um, the creation of those standards and that legislation, although it hasn't come very far yet. Um, there's this idea that advocacy and disability knowledge should be un unpaid, um, that the, that this work, how do I put that? It's, it's sort of like, thank you for that knowledge, but it's not, I think that the lack of recognition of that knowledge is very well tied to um, ideas of productivity of labor power of disabled people in a, in a different way, because very often people that aren't involved in the tra traditional labor force that have displayed are still providing their display knowledge as a form of labor power. I wondered if you wanted to speak to that and how it gets taken up. And I think academia, academia is guilty of this as well. So I don't know if you want to sp speak to that at all, but that was just where my thoughts were going. I think that that's a really important point. I mean, actually, I mean, yeah, thinking about labor power and, and, you know, I mean, if we think about it, you know, in the broadest sense, right, I mean, um, while, while, you know, most disabled people are, I mean, you know, in one sense, by definition, external to the formal labor market, that doesn't mean that people don't engage in all form, all kinds of forms of, um, you know, um, labor or you know interactions with their environment and other people, um, and um, yeah, I see, yeah, that's what, yeah. Um, and um, I think the thing is that you know, under capitalism, right? It's it's whether your labor contributes to the expansion of, of capital, whether it contributes to the expansion of, um, of wealth. Um, uh, and that is really what is defined as valuable, you know, labor. Um, and so I think, you know, again, I think it, it's sort of inherently, when you think about what it would mean to have you know, liberation of disabled people or the abolition of disability oppression, 
I think it necessarily requires revolutionary social transformation of you know the very uh, relations of production and how we organize ourselves and who owns what, and it means um, you know creating a society in which yeah everyone contributes what they you know what they can and what they're able to which is, you know, uh, inherently uh, uh, valuable um, to them and their community and those around them. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I just, yeah, I think that that's a very, a very good point that you made. Thank you, Keith. Harry, did you wanna speak to this? Well, it, I, what I did was write a message in the chat. And unfortunately, just I'm not very adept at multitasking multi windows. But I mean, uh, uh, anybody can go and Google and find this article by my friend, uh, Sonora Taylor, but uh, she used to write under the name Sunny Taylor. And uh, when she was only 21, she wrote this piece in monthly review, which has always stayed with me. And I used to teach it uh, disability and the right not to uh, work, which I think speaks to many of these things. And uh, her sister is the legendary Astra Taylor, who's written uh, many books. So she's sort of the new Naomi Klein, sort of occupies that same space. But, but what's interesting is both Taylors were homeschooled. And so I'm not someone that, I'm not an education scholar, but, but I think it's interesting. I think this is all in the public domain. They have very radical theories of education because they, they rejected schooling as a form of authoritarianism. And so their conceptions of schooling led them to, you know, have this different view of society. And so, yeah, if you check out the work of both Sonny Taylor uh, and Astra Taylor, I, I think that Sonny, Sonny Taylor in particular, uh, there, there you go. That's the uh, instant uh, magic of chat. So uh, if the audience, you can just go read that. I highly recommend that because I, I think it speaks uh, to the same things. And, and I know that Sunny uh, is also a big fan, uh, like Keith, of Marta Russell. Thank you. Um, we only have four minutes. Also, I don't know if each of you wanted to take a couple minutes before our final comments before we go. If you don't mind, I'd just like to uh, broadcast this. So uh, this is Castoriadis in V. Of course, it requires you to be able to read French. But uh, it's uh, by uh, Francois uh, Doss, who's written many books on uh, post-structuralist theory, and it's 500 pages, but I, I find it very illuminating. Most of his books have been translated to English. I don't believe this biography of Castoriadis is, but if, if you want to know everything about how Castoriadis argued with Guy Debord and situationist international in the 1960s, you know, the, the, it, it goes down to, to every last detail. Uh, you know, for those of you that came up uh, in other traditions that are not familiar with Castoriadis, it, it's it's a very illuminating read. So, but I'll uh, I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you. Um, I'll just take this opportunity since we're talking about um, Sonora Taylor. I just read. Um, her most recent book, which was released, I think, last year, called Beasts of Burden, which I would highly recommend. I think it's, you know, for those who are interested in the connections between animal studies and disability studies and um, reconceptualizations of humanity and nature. And, uh, I, I, you know, if, if you're familiar with that, you'll like it. If you're not familiar, it'll introduce you to those connections. And I think it's, I think it's really brilliant. Thanks, Keith. We have exactly two minutes left, and maybe I'll just take a minute to say what a pleasure it's been to be on a panel with both of you. It's been quite an honor, actually. Um, we don't very often get spaces like this to really talk about certainly disability and socialism in the same space. Um, so I think it's been really a pleasure to be a part of that. And um, thank you for all sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Um, 
I see a few of you thank yous in the chat as well. Um, I don't know if we actually get like cut off in the next 60 seconds, but maybe. I think we just leave. I think we just leave. Okay. But thank you for that. For your intervention, really interesting. Thanks for the to, for, yeah, thanks to the participants too. Um, I hope you can enjoy other conferences uh, or panels uh, yeah. about the Great Transition. And I'll be look, I'm looking forward to reading the um, Ravi the, the article Ravi is talking about. So thanks. For yeah. That. It's toujours un plaisir et merci pour uh, votre ton travail. C'est uh, uh, c'est un plaisir la pour l'opportunité de parler uh, cet après-midi. Merci à tout le monde. Thanks everybody. Melissa, thank you very much. For... Oh, you're welcome. welcome. Yeah. So, so we'll chat next week, Melissa. Eh? We have that call scheduled. Yes, we do. Okay. We do. Okay. Take care. It's All right. Bye. 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 Bye.